So a little bit about me. Um, graduated from Minnesota State University Moorhead with a biochemistry and biotechnology degree. Finished medical school at the University of Minnesota and, of course, completed residency in family medicine at St. John's in Phelan Village. I've been here at Osceola since 2019 and have been helping out with colonoscopy since early 2020. So I have no conflict of interest or any financial interest in any products presented during this presentation. So before we talk about colon cancer screenings, we got to talk about the anatomy of the colon itself. So um, co uh, the colon consists of both the large intestine and the rectum. It's approximately about 1.5 meters long and it's divided into five parts. The first part of it is the cecum itself um, is the proximal end, goes to a same colon, then to a transverse descending and sigmoid colon. So the purpose of the colon itself to absorb water and nutrients that's left over from the processes that goes on in the small intestine, what's left over is what we normally would call stool or fecal matter, which is usually, usually stored within the rectum at the end here. So what is colorectal cancer? It's a type of cancer that affects um, the large intestine as well as the rectum itself. And we'll talk a little bit about um, how that happens. So um, colorectal cancer usually starts as a polyp. It usually starts as a small non-cancerous growth in the lining of the colon itself. As you can tell in the picture on the side here, you can see a large growth inside the opening of the colon or the lumen, and that is a polyp. They grow very slowly over time. It takes about 10 to 20 years to become cancerous itself. So it's important to get screening so we can actually remove these polyps before they become cancer. And these polyps are, um, they can vary in size. They can be small enough that they don't produce any symptoms whatsoever. So that's why it's important to get regular screening um, done. So then what are the type of polyps that grows within the um, colon itself? So um, there are three main types, um, adenomatous polyps, which are precancerous. 10% of them uh, progress to invasive carcinoma. And the risk of growing into a cancer is um, due to whether it's big, particularly if they're um, greater than one centimeter. It's also the number of polyps you have. So the more polyps you have within the colon, the likelihood of one of those being cancerous is higher. And of course, any um, histological changes that indicates early mutations that may be causing signs into colon cancer itself. And of course, all individuals, 33 to 50% of everyone will develop some type of adenoma within their lifetime. So it's also very important to get screened appropriately. The other type of polyps that grows are hyperplastic or inflammatory polyps. These usually grow um, on the lining and it's usually non-cancerous uh, non growth. We usually find a lot of these type of polyps, particularly in the rectum, where there's a little bit more agitation from the stool itself. Uh, we would take some of them out, but they usually don't cause issues in the future. So um, a little bit of statistics and incidents about colorectal cancer itself. So colon cancer is the most common cancer in both, the third most common cancer in both men and women. It's the th third leading cause of cancer related death in men following prostate cancer as well as um, lung cancer. It, this is not counting any type of skin cancer. Um, and it's the second most common cause of cancer-related death in women. Um, surprisingly, colon cancer is similar in men and women, but rectal cancer tends to occur more in men compared to women. And the lifetime risk of developing colon cancer or colorectal cancer in men is approximately 4.3%, or one in every 25 men, and about 4% in women or one in every 23 women. So um, here is just some information about um, our states, Minnesota and Wisconsin. So the American uh, Cancer Society has a database that helps estimate the risk of new cases of colorectal cancer, as well as death from colorectal cancer. And as you can tell, in Minnesota and Wisconsin, it's approximately about the same that around 34 to 35,000 new cases will be found in either state and about 11,000 uh, people will die from colorectal cancer. It's hard to actually differentiate between colon cancer-related death versus rectal cancer-related death because most of the time it's reported as colon cancer-related death. But just some more stats for you guys to see here. 
And then here's a trend just looking over time about how often we're seeing colorectal cancer. So um, again, the reporting starts in 1975 because prior to that, we weren't keeping good records of what people are dying from. But since 1975, we saw a slight increase in the number of colorectal cancers. But since 1985, it has um, slowly downtrended. And this is likely because we're finding, um, we're doing more colon cancer screenings and detecting polyps before they can become cancer, as well as improving risk factors like quit smoking um, and having people take care of themselves more. Of course, the mortality has stayed relatively stable, but more recently has been downtrending. So less and less people are dying from colorectal cancer. What's interesting, however, is that um, different age groups will have different incidents of colorectal cancer. And over the past few decades, we've noticed that younger and younger people, particularly younger males, are having more incidents of colorectal cancer. So we're finding more colorectal cancers in younger males compared to older ones. And um, since we're screening older um, age males and females, <clears throat> the rates of colon cancer as well as the death from colon cancer is going down. And here's just a look at um, the incidence rate across country. As you can tell, Minnesota and Wisconsin, right smack in the middle, a little bit less in the southwestern region, a little bit more in the Louisiana, Mississippi, and Kentucky, West Virginia area. I don't know why that is, but interesting to see. So um, what are some risk factors that uh, puts you more at risk for developing colorectal cancer? So um, older age is one uh, risk factor, and so we'll talk a little bit more about that in the following slides. Gender can play a role as well too. African-American, uh, people tend to be more likely to develop um, early colorectal cancers. So it's actually recommended that uh, people of African-American descent should be screened at an earlier age at 45. And of course, we'll talk more about personal and family history of colorectal cancer and polyps. Inflammatory intestinal disease, things like Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis that causes inflammation um, throughout the colon can cause it to become um, more risky for development of colorectal cancer. The longer you've had Crohn's disease and also colitis that's uncontrolled, puts you at a higher risk of developing colorectal cancer. Of course, uh, poor diet, um, obesity, um, having a sedentary lifestyle, having type two diabetes, smoking and alcohol use, all puts you at risk for just um, chronic uh, comorbid diseases and will make you more likely to develop in colorectal cancer. And of course, any radiation therapy. So if you had cancer in the abdomen that required direct radiation to the abdomen itself makes it more likely to develop into cancer. And then what's interesting is aspirin and um, NSAIDs, things like uh, ibuprofen, Tylenol, naproxen, there are some evidence that's showing that it is actually preventative. So it actually helps decrease the risk of developing colorectal cancer. But again, there's no clear guidelines about it. It's only just um, some evidence and a few studies. So to dive more into certain risk factors, um, age um, being a very important risk factors, majority of colorectal cancer occurs in those older than 50. As you get older and older, your chances of having colorectal cancers are greater. So um, for colon cancer itself, again, that's the uh, cancer that develops within the um, cecum, ascending, transverse, descending, and sigmoid colon. The average age of diagnosis is around 68 for males and about 72 for females. Rectal cancers, um, usually around the age of 63 for both males and females. But as you can tell when we talked about earlier, more and more younger individuals, particularly between the ages of 45 and 50, have been um, diagnosed with colon cancer. For gender, um, we're seeing approximately 30% or up to 30% higher rates of colorectal cancer in men compared to women. And it's not really clear why that is. There's some discussions about whether hormones are causing changes or um, being on estrogen therapy would be preventative, but it's unclear exactly why there's a difference between men and women. Do I need to slow down Lisa at all? 
No, nope. um, right. I had Chris raising her hand and I'm just asking her if she had a question. All right, we'll keep going. If Chris has a question, we'll answer it. So um, other family, other risk factors is a significant family history. So if you have anyone in the family who has a history of colorectal cancer, your um, risk of having colorectal cancer yourself goes up by 30%, and particularly um, more if you have a first degree relative. So either a sibling, parents, or, um, or a child with colorectal cancer. And it can be as high as two to six times the risk factors as the general population. And then there's some evidence that shows that maybe it goes beyond first uh, degree relatives. Maybe if your cousins, grandparents, um, uncles or aunts have colorectal cancer, you may be at higher risk of developing colorectal cancer as well. And people who have a family history of colorectal cancer should um, have colonoscopy um, either at age 40 or um, 10 years before um, their relative uh, was diagnosed with colorectal cancer, whichever one is younger or earlier in age. So if you have any concerns about having a family history of colorectal cancer, you should definitely talk to your physician about getting tested and getting tested earlier. And then of course, um, inherited syndromes like familial adenomatous polypulpsis and Lynn syndrome puts you at higher risk of colorectal cancer so if anyone's in the family has ever been diagnosed with FAP or Lynch syndrome, definitely should um, talk to their doctors about getting genetic testing or getting screened earlier as well. So um, what are ways that colorectal cancer can present? So in what situations do we find colorectal cancers? One of them is that we find them on routine screening. So a person who has no symptoms, whatever, is coming in for age appropriate screenings, which became positive. We go through the different screening tests and we end up finding colorectal cancers without them having any symptoms whatsoever. There's also a case where they're coming in with suspicious symptoms, um, things like bowel changes or blood in your stools. Um, will present that way with colorectal cancer. And approximately 20% of uh, patients in the US will have metastatic disease by the time they're presenting if they're just seeing um, a provider for suspicious symptoms. So it's very important for you to talk to your doctor if you start having bowel changes or signs or concerns for colorectal cancer. And of course we see it in the third situation is when you're in the hospital for intestinal obstruction or a gastrointestinal bleeding Sometimes that could be colorectal presenting. So um, here are some of the symptoms for colorectal cancer is that sometimes you see changes in bowel habits. So you may have new onset constipation or diarrhea, or you may be having them more often or more frequently. You may also notice rectal bleeding or blood in your stools. You may also notice very dark or black uh, stools. I usually describe it as like a jet black, like just a complete blackout of your stools. You could have abdominal cramps or bloated feelings or abdominal pain. You can have unexplained weight loss. So uh, if you're losing weight without knowing or without intentionally trying to lose weight, that's always very concerning for um, cancers. And of course, changes in your appetite, feeling the urge of having to have bowel movements even though your bowels are empty or feeling like there's a rectal mass or something that is left behind after having a bowel movement. Those are, um, concerning for possible rectal cancers. So why do we screen for colorectal cancer? Um, we screen because um, colorectal cancer usually presents uh, as a small growth, uh, particularly of polyps, and slowly over time will turn into cancer. And if we screen for colorectal cancer, we can actually prevent colon cancer by removing the polyp and getting rid of it entirely before it can turn into cancer. And it's actually shown that if we do colon cancer, colorectal cancer screenings, the incidence and the uh, mortality decrease, increasing your likelihood of surviving colorectal cancer. So who should be screened? So various different organizations throughout the United States have um, slight interpretation of, of their own recommendation. The one that is probably the most common and the one that's most followed is the United States Preventive Service Task Force. It recommends that we screen all adults um, ages 50 to 75. 
And then anyone older than 75 um, to 85 should really have a discussion about whether they should continue to have colonoscopy or whether they should even have the first colonoscopy if they haven't had it since then. And then of course, anyone over the age of 85 should not have screening tests only because the risk of the procedure outweighs the benefits. And we talk about whether screenings would be recommended for anyone who um, doesn't have a long um, life expectancy. So the risk of the procedure um, versus your life expectancy should be discussed with your physician. And then of course, we talked about if you have a family history, you should be screened sooner either at an earlier age of 40 years or 10 years before uh, the age that your family member was diagnosed, which wherever one is earlier. And um, the American Academy of Family Physician, as well as the American College of Physician, we usually follow pretty closely with the United States Premier of the Service Task Force. The American Cancer Society and the American Gastroenterology Association um, has a little bit more cons uh, aggressive colon cancer screenings. They actually recommend screening at a younger age of 45 only because we're seeing younger and younger people having colorectal cancer. And really for anyone older than the age of 75, it should just really have a discussion with their um, physician about whether they should have colon cancer screenings. So um, according to um, the National Health Interview Survey conducted by the um, Center for Disease Control, the CDC, that in adults over the age of 50, where uh, recommendation for colorectal cancer is recommended, um, screening went from 34% in 2000 to 63% in 2015, which is great. But I think there's still a lot of room for us to grow to try and get more people screened. So in the survey in 2015, 7% of adults age greater than 50 reported that they had at least some type of colorectal cancer screening with either a FIT test or an FOBT test. And we'll discuss the different tests in a little bit. 60% of people reported that they had a sigmoidoscopy in the past five years and, or a colonoscopy in 10 years. And that people between the ages of 50 and 64 years were less likely to be screened compared to those older than 64. And of course, screening was the lowest among those who don't have insurance as well as those who recently immigrated to the US less than 10 years, likely due to um, different uh, factors such as being uninsured. And of course, there are major differences between certain states. So we'll see in the next slide here. These are um, the screening percentages of different states throughout the country. So as you can tell, Minnesota, Wisconsin is doing pretty well in the 70s. Um, states uh, in the South does a little bit less around 59, 63. But really, we can do a lot better to try and get these numbers up higher. So what are the barriers um, that uh, prevents people from getting colon colorectal cancer screenings? So screening is affected by both general um, barriers as well as individual barriers. So people who don't usually get source of care don't have discussions about colorectal cancer screening. So they usually don't get their preventative screens. Um, people with inadequate insurance coverage because um, it's not always covered by insurance. So sometimes the costs or deductibles are a little too high and people would prefer not to get the screenings that they should be getting. And then of course, lack of provider recommendations. So doctors not having honest and open discussions about getting screened for colorectal cancers. And of course, um, logistical factors, getting transportation, getting scheduling, uh, getting time off of work to be able to do the prep work for colon cancer screenings, as well as language barriers. And then fear and lack of knowledge about uh, what could result from colon cancer screenings, as well as um, what are the details behind the procedure itself. So now I'm jumping a little bit more into the actual tests and we'll probably slow down a little bit into each one of these because this is probably the biggest part of the presentation is that um, what are the different methods for screening? So here are the various um, different methods. It's not a full comprehensive list, but this is the most uh, common test that is offered here in the United States. But no matter which one you end up choosing, um, the best method is one that gets completed. So um, even though certain uh, procedures or certain screening options are recommended above others, it doesn't really matter as long as you get screened at the end of the day. So um, 
The first one being the most common here in the United States is colonoscopy. So what exactly is a colonoscopy? So colonoscopy is a procedure where they take a scope uh, with the camera at the very end. The scope is the size of your thumb here. And um, basically introduces into your rectum and goes around the entire uh, large colon all the way to the very end at the cecum. And then looks around to see if there's any polyps or signs of cancer. The benefits of doing a colonoscopy is that it can take a look at the entire colon and that it can biopsy and remove polyps, which can lead to cancers in the future. It can also diagnose other diseases. So if you have co-current diarrhea or constipation issues, they can also get random biopsies to try and figure out exactly other things that may be causing those issues. And then of course, the biggest benefit of a colonoscopy is that if any of the other screening colon cancer tests comes back positive, you're basically required to get a colonoscopy to look for why it is um, abnormal. Some limitations to getting a colonoscopy is that it requires a full bowel prep. So it does take about a day to a day and a half of taking um, laxatives as well as bowel regimens to make sure you clean out your colon because to be able to take a look around the entire colon, you gotta make sure it's nice and clean. Of course, um, some other uh, limitations would be that you would get a little sedation to help make you feel sleepy. So that way um, you're not feeling the crampiness from the scope induction. And you may need a chaperone because um, after the procedure, you may not be able to drive and probably would recommend not to be making any major decisions until the sedation wears off. And of course, some people will need to take time off of work just to recover after the colonoscopy. Now, there is a risk of um, bowel injuries or bowel tears as well as infections compared to other um, colonoscopy screenings, but these are very, very low. Um, perforations or bowel tears occurs approximately three in four out of every 10,000 cases. So very, very rare. Infections slightly a little bit more common, but again, um, very, very rare in the 0.1 percentage. And then of course, um, the biggest reason for this is that if it is negative, you're good for 10 years. So you don't need repeat testing for 10 years. And it is the longest of any tests. If there are findings of polyps, that interval may change down to five years or even down to three years, depending on what the colonoscopist or the um, surgeon finds. The next test, uh, which is known as flexible sig sigmoscopy, it's similar to a colonoscopy, except that it doesn't go throughout the whole entire colon. It only goes up to the sigmoid pass rectum. It's a fairly quick exam. You don't need to do a lot of bowel prep. You may need to do an enema the day of, um, but there's no sedation needed. You don't need to be put to sleep or anything like that. Um, but it can only view a very limited amount of the colon. It cannot remove large polyps because the scope is a lot smaller and there's still risk of infections. And this is only good for five years. Now, because you're only looking for um, changes within the, uh, the last third of the colon, you're missing potential cancers in the rest of the colon. So because of that, and because of the availability of colonoscopy, this is being done less and less. So, but it's still an option out there. The next test is uh, what we call a computated uh, tomography colonography, also known as a virtual colonoscopy. Basically, uh, this is a virtual colonoscopy where they uh, would put you um, underneath a CT scanner. They would give you a little bit of um, radiation to be able to take a look at bowels and rebuild the images to be able to go around and take a look. It's actually pretty good to detect large polyps, but not very good at looking at small polyps. And of course, because this is a virtual image, um, it can't remove any biopsies or, or uh, remove any polyps as well. Um, and it also requires full bowel prep. So you need to clean out the colon or else the CT scans can't see around those stool mass. And of course, uh, because this is newer technologies, it's very limited availability. Only certain places and big medical centers will offer this type of um, study. So, and if completely normal, you're good for every five years. And then, um, Another option would be what we call a double contrast barium atom, uh, enema. So basically uh, it can usually look at the entire colon. We put dye through the rectum and um, have it go throughout their entire colon moving backwards. There are very few complications with this, but you still need a full bowel prep. It, again, can't remove any polyps because it's more of an image type study. 
You do get low dose radiation because it is an x-ray to be able to take a look at this. But if completely normal, you'd be good for every five years. The limitation to this is that it's a very old type of method of colorectal screenings, and it's not offered by a lot of people. And it takes a very specialized radiologist to be able to read these studies. So as, uh, as it's being done less and less, it's probably gonna phase out and no longer be an option, but for now it still is. Now, jumping uh, towards um, chemical tests instead of doing actual visualized tests, um, the first one is what we call an FOBT or a fecal occult blood test. Basically, this is a chemical reaction to blood in your stool sample. You don't need to do a, a bowel prep and it can be done at home. So you don't have to be in a medical facility and it's very, very cheap. Basically, you go home, you grab a stool sample on one of these sticks and you uh, smear it right onto the slots that you can see on the sides there. You're going to have to collect multiple samples because we don't we want to avoid any false negative or false positive. So we want to grab uh, multiple samples. It will miss most polyps because early polyps or small polyps won't have bleeding. So without blood there, it won't react. Now, what's interesting is that these tests will also react to any other sorts of blood in your stool. So if you ate a raw piece of steak and have blood in your colon, it could make this test positive. And of course, we would tell people to stop their aspirin therapy or ibuprofen because if it can cause a little bit of bleeding from gastritis or other ulcerations, it can make the test positive as well. One of the biggest thing about this is that it needs to be done every single year. So the next test is known as the fecal immunochemical test. This is becoming more common compared to the fecal occult blood test that we talked about earlier. It uses a special antibody against hemoglobin and particularly against human um, hemoglobin. So um, it won't uh, change based on what you're eating or any medication that you're taking. It can also be done at home, but it does need a little bit of bowel cleansing. You don't require any sedation. Um, you just have to have a bowel movement, grab a little bit of stick swab, swab it onto a card and put it back in its container and then bring it back to lab. So it may be positive for GI bleed. So if you have a history of um, like an ulceration or a gastritis, it can be falsely positive. And it's less sensitive for right-sided colorectal cancer. So um, if you do have concerns or risk factors for right-sided colorectal cancer, it can miss it. And again, this test needs to be done every single year. And then the newest uh, tests out there, uh, other than the virtual colonoscopy, is a test called Cologuard. You probably heard about this on TV. It's a multi-targeted stool DNA testing. So it tests for DNA mutation within the stool itself. Um, it's nice and convenient because it doesn't need any bowel prep. It can be done at home, and it only requires one sample. It will miss uh, most polyps. Again, it's detecting um, DNA that's secreted through blood from polyps. But um, if those polyps aren't um, bleeding, it may be negative. The limitation to this is that if it turns uh, positive, you still would need a colonoscopy. But if it remains negative, you're good uh, for three years. So you just have to repeat this every three years. And um, this Cologuard test is actually being covered more and more by insurance. But we always ask people to check in with their insurance just to make sure. And then, uh, so those are the major tests for colon, uh, rectal cancer screenings. Um, again, if you have any questions or concerns, or you just want a discussion, definitely reach out to your um, doctor or your provider to discuss more about which would be a good option for you. In the end, again, getting I, any of them would be good as long as you get one of them done. So uh, to sort of end our talk a little bit, um, some lifestyle changes that you can do to help reduce your risk of colon cancer is basically living a healthier lifestyle. So eating lots of fruits, vegetables, whole grains, um, diet high in fiber can help prevent colon or colorectal cancers. Um, drinking alcohol in moderation, if at all, if you can avoid drinking alcohol at all, it would definitely reduce your risk of developing colon cancer. Um, smoking cessation, um, being active, as well as maintaining a healthy weight definitely plays a role in reducing your risk of getting colon cancer. Again, aspirin is controversial. Most people are on aspirin for different other reasons, heart issues or brain issues, 
but there are some evidence that shows that it can help protect against developing colorectal cancers as well. And then, of course, the biggest way to reduce your risk of getting colorectal cancer is just to get screened. So in summary, um, get screened as recommended. Colon cancer is a common uh, cause of cancer and cancer-related death. It can be limited by removing polyps or precursors before they become cancerous. Family history is important to determine your risk factor for colorectal cancer and when you should be screened. Uh, work on living a, a healthier lifestyle will help limit your risk for developing colorectal cancers and of course, managing your other medical illnesses. And of course, uh, following up with your physician if you have any questions or concerns just to have a more comprehensive discussion. And those are my references. Any questions? Sorry, I went through that a little quick. All right, so um, one question is, with the FIT DNA test, the color guard, why does the ad say that people with a family history of colon cancer not to use the test? So with the, with the colon guard test, it's actually recommended for people at average risk. Because of a family history increases your risk by two to six times fold, um, sometimes the colon guard can remain negative even though you might present with uh, a polyp or uh, concerns for cancer. So it's actually not recommended for people at higher risk of colon cancer, which an individual with a family history would be categorized as a um, higher risk for colorectal cancer, in, in which case it's colonoscopy. The, um, other tests shouldn't be used either. Um, a FIT test uh, every year can sometimes uh, be recommended, but true and true, most doctors will recommend colonoscopy at that time. And so what we're gonna kind of conclude with is really just, it's super important to have that discussion with your healthcare provider to see what's colon, or what colon screenings or options are best for you. Um, and if you don't have a healthcare provider and you're interested in having that one-on-one -on -one discussion with Dr. Wynn or any one of our other providers that we have, you can feel free to give us a call at 715-294-5680. And it's just really important to have that discussion. Um, if you're nervous about doing the colonoscopies, anything else, just like Dr. Wynn had said, is screening, getting screening is just best. So um, I guess we'll end with that, unless anybody else has any other questions. But we want to thank you guys so much for attending with us and sticking with us tonight. And we will follow up with the email um, and have a survey in the email as well, if you guys would just want to let us know. Um, what you guys thought. And if you have any other questions, um, feel free to answer those, ask those in the email as well. So 